Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Solidarity Live. We have a year as eventful as the last one, for better or for worse. And at almost the one-year mark of quarantine slash coronavirus era, we're here to have some very interesting conversations with some very interesting people. Hi, Alex. Good morning. Hi, Jocelyn. Morning. Yeah, it's a uh, 2021. It's, a, it's another uh, uh, jam-packed year. Uh, the weeks are months. It might be getting a little bit faster. Um, like this week only felt like two or three months. Um, but there's a lot that happened. Uh, and so I'm really happy to be joined by a good friend, the president of Social Security Works PAC, uh, uh, John Bowser Bauman, who is just uh, an all around activist, extraordinaire, political um everything. So John, thanks for joining us on Solidarity Live. Alex. Um, what about, it's hard to know where to start because I want to talk about the cycle. Um, sure. You did so much work on the cycle. So probably start there, but I do want to talk about, we just saw the dumbest part of uh, the legislative process, which is Votorama. Um, but there's actually like, it's teeing up a huge thing and uh, we're moving pretty fast. People are obviously angry we're not moving fast enough um, or the Democrats aren't moving fast enough to get relief out. But if you compare this to 2009, for example, this is like as Lightning. fast as I've ever seen. Right. Um, but let, let's kind of start with the political because I think what you know uh, from going around the country is that if the Democrats don't go like that fast and deliver, um, it's, it's not going to look pretty uh, in, in a couple of years. So why don't you tell me a little bit, just tell everybody about um, what you did this, this uh, cycle. So, um, you know, I did 110 events, virtual events. Um, as you know, in 2018, when it was imperative to control the house or we wouldn't have a country by now, uh, I actually literally went to 57 different campaigns and we endorsed 75 candidates and I got to 57 ca house campaigns. It's hard states. for people who don't have a, a, a for comparison. There's literally no one who does that many. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, no they have done that in 20, in, in, at, at one point, um, and even maybe in 2018, I think the only person who came close to that might have been actually Joe Biden, um, who who does the same kind of thing, uh, you know, famously does the same kind of thing. So that was a lot of a lot of campaigns on the ground. I mean, that was my most activity that I've ever that I've ever had in a cycle. Uh, this cycle was very different because I did them, I did 110 events sitting here at this piano. And I sang uh, "Good Night, Donald Trump." Well, it's time to go. At least 110 times, probably more, because I probably did it multiple times during some, you know, events. So um, that seemed to work. It got, you know, 350,000 hits on Twitter or something. Um, but as you know, I also try to kind of know what I'm talking about when it comes to uh, things like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, drug prices, um, and we, you, you and I try to get every candidate to say that they'll never refer to Social Security and Medicare as, as entitlements, but uh, rather use the uh, term earned benefits. So that's our questionnaire. We get every candidate to, uh, to agree to all those things, you know, expand Social Security, expand Medicare, Medicaid expansion as the Fight the Affordable Care Act, fight to lower drug prices, and always say earned benefits. And then we'll endorse them and I'll do an event with them. And, you know, we had an interesting cycle. Uh, you know, I started every speech with um, on the night of November 3rd, Joe Biden's got to be doing this, which was my old Bowser character from Shot on Up for, for the old people who are watching us um, or, or, or YouTube aficionados who can find old episodes. Yeah, just, go just Google <laughs> Bowser uh, the Ramones and that should... <laughs> Come up and watch that one. That, I think that one's my That was favorite. a good episode. That was a famous episode. We had the Ramones as a guest, which was very, very unusual for our guest list, which usually was like Bobby Rydell or Chubby Checker. You know, okay. so somehow the Ramones were out there. It's sometimes the Ramones. Yeah, they were great. <laughs> and, you know, 
hey, we, we were rock and roll and they were rock and roll. So anyway, uh, we Joe Biden did succeed somehow, apparently, in doing this on the night of November 3rd. I don't know if it was literal. Uh, and and uh, we squeaked everything. Well, I mean, the Biden win was more than a squeak, but the, yeah, the Biden win was the only thing that wasn't, wasn't a squeak. But I, from your, I mean, you've been but doing the popular this popular vote wasn't a squeak, but the Electoral College was still, you know, it was 43,000, 43,000 well or poorly, depending on how you look at it, votes in swing states would have resulted in us not even having a country right now. Yeah, which is obviously why we need to get rid of the Electoral College as the dumbest um, part of, of our electoral system. Somewhere even than Votorama. I know, it's, but like Votorama is the dumbest part of our legislative system. The Electoral College is uh, uh, of our, the dumbest part of our electoral. But the Electoral College is even dumber than Votorama. Uh, it is, is much dumber. It, it, it has, there's no way you can defend it. Um, and uh, this is what Chris Hayes posts all the time. Like, it, we, there was a coup, uh, uh, right? And still, if you actually kind of squint, you could see that the, the constitutional crisis of uh, overturning uh, the vote with an electoral college, I mean, you, you said it. Uh, if we, if the Democrats hadn't won in 2018, won the House, the gambit, that uh, Trump was running to overturn the election would have worked would've in, some, in worked. some fashion. Right. And you're like, okay, so there's a way in this stupid process that you can just overturn an election uh, and become a one party authoritarian state. Uh, and you're like, well, we should probably remove that path. Um, which is why the NPVIC, which is the interstate you know, compact the, the fastest way, probably the only way we could ever get rid of the Electoral College is something that I would like to work on, <laughs> which you and I need to discuss during these, this next time period, as well as all the House races that, you know, the House is going to be a, a fight for 22. Yeah. My own we, we lost perception. a bunch of seats. Right. Uh, we lost a bunch of seats, and now we're on a very narrow margin. And, you know, there's going to be redistricting that mostly um, the, the good guys are not in charge of. So that's going to make things more difficult. Uh, and it's a very narrow margin. So there's going to be a real fight to keep the, to, to hold on to the House and consequently be able to get anything done within between 22 and 24. Um, the Senate actually has a, a little bit better map than the ones we've been dealing with in 2022. So I'm, I'm sort of bullish on, on the Senate prospect for 2022, but I think the House is going to be a mad scramble. Well, John, so um, your op-ed for The Hill recently, yeah. you talked about the extent to which seniors really came out for Joe Biden. And apparently you saw that at these hundreds of rallies you were doing, virtual rallies. <laughs> so how... What do you think that looks like? What does it look like for the Biden administration to keep its promises to seniors? Well, I mean, it's definitely incentive for the Biden administration because, you know, I, I, don't, I don't really think they need that much incentive. Honestly, I think they're, they're trying to do the right thing, mm -hmm. things. Uh, but, you know, no, I, I, I think back to a time during the Obama administration when I was quite friendly with with a lot of the, the campaign people. And one of them um, at one point said to me, we were talking about senior issues, which I work on. And, and literally this guy was high up in the campaign structure said, oh, you know, they didn't get him, they, they didn't get Obama elected. Seniors didn't get Obama elected. And I reacted like, wow, I can't believe you actually just said that. <laughs> That's like a crazy thing to, to say, especially to me. And I understand the way in which that was true, but it obviously shouldn't affect the way in which an administration deals with its constituents. Um, now, the Biden administration knows very well, somewhere in the back of its, of its brain, that uh, seniors did help get him elected, mm -hmm. that seniors were a huge part of getting him elected. 
And will that subliminal, subliminably, as George W. Bush used to say, uh, somewhere, somewhere in the ether, you know, make this administration a little more responsive on senior issues? And you know, certainly, will it will it spur this administration not to put together a Bowles Simpson commission? We always say it that way because the initials are better than Simpson Bowles. Um, yeah, I think it's not going to do that. What we would like this administration to do, um, obviously, is we understand it's not going to be front burner right now. There's we're in we're in massive crises, but uh, to address Social Security, uh, you know, at some point fairly soon, and also to make some changes in the um, in the in the personnel that's in the administrative structure of Social Security would be very important and could be done rather quickly. Yeah, and we've addressed that a couple times on here. The Social Security is no different than the Trump administration appointing people in bad faith who were put there to dismantle the very institutions they're the head of, which is just like, it's weird. It's like the super villains being put in charge of the ministry or whatever. Um, but I mean, Alex, I feel like you have a lot more <laughs> to say about the social security administrators specifically. Yeah, they're terrible. Get out of here. Get <laughs> out of here. The dude at the top is just a dilettante. Andrew Saul, he doesn't even know why he wants that position. Uh, it's his, it's the deputy commissioner who should be fired right away. And actually, I'm beginning to get a little annoyed with the Biden administration because they could definitely fire him right away. And he's he's the the brains of the of the assault. Um, but I want to uh, actually we can s come back, sit there. Obviously, I talk about Social Security all the time. But, John, I think like I don't think many people who who aren't you know, you, us, understand what a huge shift there was in the senior vote and, and what that means, like the magnitude of uh, seniors moving over to become, if seniors become a reliable democratic demographic, um, we're looking at a whole new ball game here and seniors should vote uh, for Democrats uh, because Republicans want to destroy Social Security, Medicare, they're in the pocket of big pharma. Too many Democrats, you know, are, are flirting with big pharma as well. But Republicans are bought and sold by big pharma. And I think the other thing that we saw, and I think this is probably what moved people the most, is uh, the Trump administration and their people and the Republican Party would go on television and just be like, eh, old people have to die. We're, we, we could do stuff to, uh, on COVID, but... We're not going to. So instead of demanding that we use the power of the federal government uh, to, to do stuff, you all should just get accustomed to dying. Um, right? I mean, like the, the lieutenant governor of Texas said basically those words. He, he even said he said he was willing to die as an old person um, so that the government didn't have to do stuff. I mean, like uh, for which what what? Uh, but it turns out that that's a bad political message, right? Like right. The, the, the people are like, mm -mm, that, mm -mm, that 110 that. times I said, I said, when you have an administration that's, that's literally saying, not even signaling to older Americans that it doesn't care whether they live or die. And in fact, some of us are just going to have to dispose, be disposed of in order to, for this guy to win re-election, uh, that doesn't go over very well. And you know what? It didn't go over very well, but it still went over, that message still went over better than it should have. We still have a way to go mm -hmm. with seniors, uh, you, you know, because there's this block of people who are older people who just don't seem to understand uh, their own self-interest and vote on very bizarre kinds of things. Uh, and it's a very long struggle, as you know, Alex, we, we fight it together all the time to try to move those people uh, in the direction of, of what's good for them, their children, and their grandchildren. Mm -hmm. So we did pretty well, and, and we need to follow up on it. What needs to be done yeah. now is, and, and I, I think people are onto this, 
Um, we can't have 2009-10 all over again, where everyone expended a tremendous amount of energy to make a very big change and then felt like, oh, well, okay, that was, that was that's done now. It's never done. Mm -hmm. So we have got to follow up on this, and I am doing so. Let, let me give you a specific example. Um, one thing that I did in this past cycle, uh, somewhat in conjunction with the DNC, was you know, which was very helpful in this regard, was create seniors councils in several of the battleground states. Uh, most notably, we have one in Florida with 240 people on it that's going to continue. We had a successful one in Arizona, um, in Wisconsin, and we're going to build on those. I'm starting one in Pennsylvania. I'm starting one in Ohio. Uh, I'm starting one in Maine. And we're doing this work now instead of, you know, close to the last minute for the campaign. We're going to do these work, this work now and Consequently, there are going to be structures in place to work with seniors and councils of seniors who are influential in their states. The one thing that you and I always say, and we should repeat it, is that in every election, seniors always show up. Seniors are always voters. And they're also always volunteers. So every campaign, every campaign staff will tell you that we can't do this without the volunteers, and the volunteers are always seniors. So, you know, this is a very important part of getting people, of, of getting better people elected. And as I know we're going to discuss a little bit later in this hour, um, you need to get better people elected in order to get anything done. The Biden-Harris administration is going to get stuff done because they got elected. Had they not gotten elected, they would get nothing done. Uh, the House is better because, these, because better people got elected. Uh, the Senate is now better because finally better people got elected. And I'm pleased to say that the last few events that I did in the cycle were in Georgia. And seniors made a big difference in Georgia. So, um, and we are also going to build now a seniors council in Georgia. They have a little one and we're going to expand it dramatically. So, uh, you know, there's pretty good unity on our side right now and i think it's going to carry us a long way but uh seniors because seniors are always voters and always volunteers are critically important to the effort i think i stepped on on when you said uh they're always volunteers because that's just so important i was saying yeah always voters and you were trying to say equally as important is right. is the fact that and they are they're not only always volunteers they're super volunteers like when when john builds a phone bank. And Jonathan, I will tell you in my in my intro of John, uh, I, I can't remember what I said exactly, but political everything, I think is what I said, because he's a dynamo. Uh, I've often said the hardest working man in politics, which then he goes, no, 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 there's a, I'm like, no, nah, this dude is the <laughs> hardest working man in politics. He built, I tried. He built the Florida Democratic Seniors Council. Uh, and I'm sitting there like, that's amazing. And also like someone probably should have done that before, right? Like, uh, but John just did it uh, and is building these things and these networks. Um, you know, it, 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 I said, uh, John and I have worked together for a long time now, um, driving around the country and I'm putting us up at uh, crappy hotels. And then John's <laughs> like, man, there's no cable news on this place. Uh, once I don't know what's going on, Alex. I can't just, you know, I, I didn't know how to use Hulu. <laughs> exactly. That was Ro Hulu. Roku. Roku. Yeah, Roku. yeah whatever that, that was. was. The gem that I found uh, that one, right? Okay. Like, <laughs> we have to go. That was in Tucson, right? Yeah, that was the Tucson. It was a, that was an awesome, awesome place. Uh, Alex, the one hotel, the one motel, hotel, kind of in Tucson that didn't have cable TV. It, well, it had Roku. And this is, this is a long time ago. Now I know how to use Roku, by the way. <laughs> yes, I'll take credit for that one. Um, but John, no, I didn't you learn it that know. night. I've learned it since. We drove that night, all, all I did was yell at you. <laughs> drove all over this country um, and, and talking to rooms full of seniors, letting them know, uh, you know, what's going on. Uh, and I think 
it's fun to talk th this discussion. If you go just four years ago at the beginning of the Trump administration, our, our road trip to defeat Trump care um, was really powerful. And we did oh, we beat Trump care. Uh, but it was also eye opening to me because you could feel the start of this change that I think we saw this uh, in this election uh, when more and more seniors were recognizing like out of the gate this the Trump administration was just coming after our earned benefits and it was so obvious and they didn't they didn't hide it uh, which is you know the only good thing I'll say about the about Trump and and his band of of Nazis is that at least they did it openly right like we I I used to have to deal with a lot of like people listening to me, but then being like, yeah, but it's probably not as bad as you say it is. The Republicans aren't that bad. Uh, I think you're probably saying they're that bad because, you know, you want the Democrats to win. And I'm like, no, I want the Re Democrats to win because the Republicans are that bad. Mm -hmm. uh, not because I love them, but because these guys want to destroy everything. And then people started seeing that. And we'd go around the country and we'd have uh, you know, like I, I'd say at the barricades, you've had all the lefties, but joining us there were older suburban, primarily women who were just like fiery, fiery activists and ready to throw down. Uh, and we'd pair a lot of that with some seniors who would run phone banks that are just like amazing because they'll just call all day. Uh, and um, we were able to defeat Trump care. And I started to see this new uh, sort of coalition or however you want to say it, the cohort that I think uh, got Biden elected. And I think that the political people saw that too because Biden actually ran the most senior focused campaign that I've ever seen a Democrat run. Um, usually Democrats run and everything is, is young people and that's great. Um, but it shouldn't, everything is not great that they focus on young people is great, but that it's the whole kit and caboodle is the problem. Um, cause you're leaving seniors who, you know, are going to vote, um, out of it. And that was so not true with Biden. He ran on, uh, expanding social security and saying, you know, Trump wants to destroy social security, which is true. Uh, and, and uh, so I, that to me. You know, like I don't trust politicians. Um, I work to make them do what they say they're going to do. And I work to make them say the right things. But we're we're already at they're saying the right things. And now we're just needing to make them do it. Does they that feel got, right to you? Right. They just got to do it now. I can't even remember when we went to when you and I went to Vegas. What, what what were we doing there when we <laughs> stayed Silver 7s for $50? Yeah, the Trump, the, so that was Trump care. Silver 7s no, is, is the biggest disagreement we have because I will admit that I've put us up at some really bad hotels that I will be like, I feel shame for doing that. But at least you can see I've forgotten all about it. <laughs> but the Silver 7s in Vegas is just wonderful. This place, <laughs> Jocelyn, uh, when you win the uh, jackpot on... Um, you know, like at, a, at, at the strip hotels, you win the jackpot and you win like a Ferrari. And at this one, you win the jackpot and it was a Camaro. And I'm like, yes. And the one jackpot down from that was a crock pot. And I was like, this is my place. <laughs> Wait, what was the problem with this? Uh, you know, it, it was rough around the edges, which I'm <laughs> into. It was, it, it, not actually nothing. There was no Wait, problem. there were there are places in Vegas that are rough around the edges that does not <laughs> that does not compute with its reputation. I, I couldn't even remember what we were doing there because I was there so much yes. trying to get rid of Dean Heller, which we actually succeeded in doing. And speaking of which, you know, this is the kind of stuff that happens. There was there was there were a group, a lot of indivisible people at that point. Mm -hmm. Um that we're getting together at Dean outside Dean Heller's office in Vegas, former senator, on Tuesdays, and I was there like five times um, in 108 degree heat. This is you really have to understand what and a lot of older people in 108 degree heat standing outside Dean Heller's office 
you know, demanding for the chief of staff to come out, which we got the chief of staff to come out every single time. And a couple of times, Alex, we had, we had Laura Packard, who's a friend of, of both of ours, who's a survivor of stage four cancer and is, you know, fantastic healthcare activist. And Andy Slavitt came in, who's now working, you know, for Biden on the, on the task force. Um, you know, a, a real cast of characters, but a lot of older people standing out in 108 to 110 degree heat demonstrating, and it worked. And although he won't really admit it, Jocelyn, all of that actually grew out of the Silver Sevens because what we were doing when John and I went uh, was we were pushing Heller to vote no okay. on... Trump care and increasing the political pressure on him, which ended up grinding him out of office. Uh, right. And that, that was the first connection. That, that actually is like the perfect uh, thing because we connected with that indivisible crew, which is like primarily older women, uh, fiery now activists at the barricades. And we pulled together uh, a, a crew of seniors who were organizing um, a lot of uh, friends of John's. John is like uh, just a natural organizer. And I think uh, part of it comes from Sha Na Na tour days. First of all, he puts together the map like a road, like a, like a, you know, a musical tour. Uh, and then wherever we go, he's got a Rolodex of uh, people, of lefties he's, he, who he's met over the years and we connect them, uh, have an event we built that bridge between the senior organizers and um, the Indivisible crew and got them to see, got everyone to see that solidarity, right? Like the older um, activists, the senior activists are, are focused on social security, on Medicare, on drug prices. Uh, and I think the Indivisible crew were a lot focused on just how terrible Trump was and you know uh, what's happening at the border and stuff. And we were able to connect these two worlds so that they saw this is one opponent that we have. Like the worldview that would put children in cages is the same worldview and ideology that will allow seniors, they don't know this at the time, but it came into stark relief later, that will let seniors die of COVID uh, because they, they think of people as disposable if you're not them. Right. And that that was what we were fighting, this proto fascist that I just will call a fascist or authoritarian movement. Uh, and then John just kept going back and, and uh, you know, having folks standing outside. When we went, John, we remember we brought the cameras into uh, their office, the office and, and uh, which they definitely didn't. I just couldn't remember the sequence. I mean, <laughs> of course, you know, but you're right. The sequence is really important. Yeah. Because we work on policy, we try to hold politicians accountable for what they said they were going to do once they are in office. And then we work, if they do that, we work to get them reelected. And if they don't do that, we work to get better people elected. Right. And that's, that's the endless sequence which continues and we can't take a minute off. We got to just keep doing what we're doing. This this is a critical moment right now because it's all like you said, Alex. You know, we really should emphasize this has never been out in the open mm -hmm. to this extent. This is the most out in the open all of it has ever been. Been I've said for a very long time that the Republican Party is basically a a coalition of the super greedy and the tremendously bigoted because the super greedy understand that they really don't have enough soup. There aren't enough super greedy, you know, business people um, in charge of things in America. You know, they, that terrible mistake was made, was made hundreds of years ago of giving one, one, one person one vote. So there aren't enough of them to actually win anything. And by the way, we should say that the definition of one person at that time was not very, was not really one person. And it was it was the same greedy kinds of people, the same so greedy really, plutocrats right. who did that. Right, it was really geared to keep white male landowners in power by giving them the one vote. Okay, we've corrected a bunch of that. 
over the years because one thing those guys did that was smart was to allow for an amendment process to understand that this wasn't going to be etched in stone. And uh, that allowed others to amend the Constitution and make it much better. Okay, right now, here's where we are. The greedy don't have enough votes. They must gin up the wildly bigoted, and sometimes the greedy are also wildly bigoted, um, you know, hard to get inside their heads, but that's the coalition. And that's what, that's who we're fighting. And that's who seniors are stepping up, you know, and helping to defeat, as are all decent people in America. But it's out in the open now. And, you know, that's an interesting insight because I've always wondered about that, right? How did this horrifying toxic marriage of bigots and capitalists happen? But I think you're right. There aren't enough. There isn't enough hatred and greed. So you've got to combine them and bring them together. <laughs> and, you know, one. Enough, right. There aren't enough. <laughs> there literally aren't enough people, you know, who are super greedy. I mean, there's a real question here. There's a it's real a underlying question here that my wife asks all the time. Um, you know, she's an educator. The question that's always on her mind is, how much money do people think that they need? Like, what is really going on here? <laughs> because you're dealing with these people who have, you know, like, I, I don't know, even just take Mitch McConnell and all the money that got scammed off of whatever the wife's business is and whatever, you know, or Dick Cheney, you know, who was was making 65 mil a, a year or something from Halliburton you know it's like okay these are people who the, the the viewpoint appears to be like oh no I want everything I should have everything like you should have nothing because I'm better than you in some way or another so I should have everything You're, I could never have enough John I love that you bring that up because it's something I think I, I think about it a lot too and it's something I think every moral person should be putting at the forefront of their consciousness right now. We have accepted this idea that it's okay for a certain percentage of the population to hoard resources in a violent, incredible capacity. How does one even use more than $65 million? Seriously, if you accept that a really gorgeous mansion is like a few million dollars, how many mansions do you need and that would be a value neutral situation if we weren't also dealing with extreme poverty and incredible rates all across our country and world. And it's like, when it comes to talking to seniors, I'm really interested to hear in your experience over the past year, because a lot of seniors have voted Republican and that wasn't as true this time. Do you think it's the COVID thing? Do you think the Republican Party has just gone too far? What do you think that was? Well, I think the COVID, I, I think that COVID triggered a lot of movement mm -hmm. among seniors. I think that sadly, uh, you know, what Alex and I have dealt with, with seniors and, you know, over decades now, is that there's a, there is a cultural kind of quote, conservatism, it's not real conservatism, that, you know, people do vote on to some extent, and they end up voting against their own best interest. Because, you know, things like Social Security, we should say, Social Security is a modest program. Social Security has kept more people out of poverty than any other program in American history. Social Security and Medicare combined certainly have kept not even close as to, you know, they, they are close to each other as far as keeping people out of poverty. Before Social Security was passed, 50% of seniors were, over 50% were lived below, had incomes below the poverty line. Before Medicare was passed, it was still 35%. And the most commonly used metric, you know, before the pandemic was 8.7%. Those are big differences. Those two programs have kept more people out of poverty than any other social programs in, in American history, period. And you know, older people know that they love those programs, but you know, they do get hung up on, many of them get hung up on stuff like, you know, I don't like tattoos or I don't like rap music or whatever is really going on, you know, about the but good John, old days. I think you're, you're sort you're right, but you're sort of dancing around one aspect, which is all those things are coming from Fox News and 
are coming well, they're, from they're a, getting fed that diet, right? A coordinated. So this is the part that makes that maddens me, because um, seniors used to vote for uh, Democrats. They were Democratic voters. They were reliable Democratic voters. And you still see that in the tale of the silent generation, um, that they're, they're still uh, more left than younger seniors. And what happened is in the 70s, the greedy, the plutocrats, the billionaire class actually recognized what we try to get the Democrats to recognize all the time. They're like, hey, you know who votes every single time? Seniors. You know what we should do? We should figure out a way to capture the next senior cohort. Uh, and they built a propaganda, propaganda infrastructure to do just that. And if you watch Fox News and you understand that its purpose is right. purpose is literally to scare older people into voting Republican, the whole thing makes sense. And then you see that their one message, uh, and I'm just agreeing with you, John, just vociferously. Well, fear. Fear, it's fear, fear, fear that yeah. their way of living is slipping away right. from them, right? That there was this way, and now all this change is happening, and it's all bad. Uh, and only the, the reactionary, the Republican way is going to hold on to that real America. Um, right. And they... It's incredibly powerful propaganda. So what we're talking about is actually a countervailing uh, force, right? Like that we're trying to say, don't believe the hype. The hype is wrong. You have to actually look at the issues and who's doing what. And we've been trying to sell it for a long time and, you know, having some success. Uh, 2018 wasn't, uh, 2020 wasn't the first success we had. We're slowly winning back the senior right. cohort, the younger senior cohort, the boomers. Um, and but 2020 made it uh, sort of easier because they kept coming on TV and being like, no, we don't care about you seniors. You can go die as long as the stock market doesn't go down. Um, and then it became really more clear about what was going on. Uh, so that's why we do this show. Right. Like it's not like we can. Uh, go up against Rupert Murdoch, but the cultural power that has been brought to bear on bringing seniors to vote for the billionaire class uh, by scaring them about losing their cultural identity is something that like, you know, we study just every day. It's what we're fighting. Um, so I will just say my prediction is if Democrats are able to deliver right. on, on, on the promises that they made, there's a very real possibility that, that seniors can break free from some of that propaganda effect um, and come back to saying, you know what, I'm going to vote for the party that created Social Security, the party that created Medicare, the party that's increasing these programs uh, and not destroying them. And that's where I, I, I want to say at this juncture, you know, this is why over the decades that I've been doing this now, I think I'm actually a fairly good messenger for this. Because the fairly tie good. He's the best. <laughs> but, it, but the tie-in is something that's relatively subtle that I don't know if you guys, you know, would even think about or recognize. But the Bowser character, you know, we were dealing with the music of the 50s and the 60s, which is wonderful music, which, by the way, what really happened with early rock music was that it brought the country to it brought the country together in a way that had never happened before, um, particularly among diverse populations. In other words, this was really essentially black music um, being listened to by white kids, mm -hmm. and and it melded the culture in a way that I you know some of some of that. It, it has continued, but for the generation that lived it, they lost a lot of that. Um, and, and, you know, it's one of the things that I work every day to try to bring back is for them to understand what really happened in the 50s and, and why, you know, Pat Boone's records covering Little Richard records were a horrible turn of events. 
And basically people understood that at the time. And a lot of them who are now seniors, you know, Vietnam was a tremendously cloudy um, event in the history. It, it, it's something that I talk about all the time. It's something that will never be reconciled for my generation, ever. Um, it's just, you, you know, we've moved on from it in a way that Iraq was sort of like it, but there were a lot fewer body bags. And yes, that was progress. But this idea of missionless wars, you know, of leading Americans being led into wars where no one understood what the mission was, this affected my generation mightily. But not to get too far off, off the real point that I was trying to make, um, the music of the 50s kind of, 50s and early 60s, in reminiscing, too many older people are looking back at it as, oh yeah, that was happy days. That was, you know, a much, a much happier time when of course we were, you know, schools were segregated and, you know, Leave it to Beaver was not real, guys. Leave it to Beaver was not America. Um, and, and consequently, I become a fairly good messenger because, I, you know, when they realize that, okay, I'm looking at things from a very different way than let's bring back, let's bring back the good old days. Um, it, it does jar some people out of their Republicanish reverie, you know, of thinking that, yeah, that's what we're trying to do, make America great again, bring us back to a time, what does that really mean? Bring us back to a time when um, a lot of people couldn't vote, a lot of people couldn't participate, a lot, you know, pick, pick a version of that, of that time that we're talking about, but none of these were good times. Well, John, I love, you're really helping me, I think, understand something, which is you're absolutely correct. A lot of these seniors have understandable nostalgia that they're re reacting to. And it sounds like the answer for us as progressive organizers, or, I mean, I don't even think anything we want is terribly progressive at this point. Let's not kill parts of the population shouldn't be right. a radical far left idea. <laughs> but it, you know, it sounds like the answer is for us to work with that nostalgia and not against it because you bring up something that I think about a lot. We do now accept the idea of the baby boomers as this like Republican, but like, you're right. This is the generation that lived through Vietnam. This is the generation that, dealt with the civil rights movement in a really beautiful way. Like there's not, how does that happen? You know, and it's sad. It's super split. This generation is, is really split, but because getting back to electoral stuff, which is really simple when you think about it, because this generation always shows up, it's hugely important to deal with it, mm -hmm. you know, as split as it is. Every, every inroad that can be made with this generation is massively important because the people always show up. Uh, you know, the task in dealing with younger people is a different task. It's to make sure that they show up. Right. They, you don't have to convince them on the issues because they're actually already there, but they might have been told the same propaganda canon that creates, I like your reverie because I think what it is is to like, put people to sleep some and even get seniors to misremember the their own past, right? Like that's how our brains work. We don't like remembering the whole truth. We would like remembering the good parts of what happened. Uh, and that is the, that's the, the poisonous part of nostalgia, right? That's the, the good old days. And you're like, well, you remember they weren't that great. There was a very famous show called Father Knows Best, okay? I mean, just on the face of it, <laughs> what kind of title is that? Right. You know, for, for, for us in 2021, that's certainly not something that's going to fly. Mm -hmm. But there are people who look back on that as, yes, that was a wonderful era. I mean, I always think of, we, we could talk about this stuff all day, but I always think of... Um, the speech that Marilyn Quayle gave at the Republican convention, which was basically a women, women, women really do belong in the kitchen speech. Um, and I remember thinking as she was giving that speech, you know, decades ago now, it's like, 
wow, you have absolutely no cognizance that if it weren't for women fighting for, for <laughs> equality and for simple, basic human rights, you would never be in a million years be up here making this speech. Like, do you not know that at all? Like, you have no I think about that constantly. Whenever I see these Republican women who, whether it's like at a low level with their YouTube channels about how to stay home better or at a high level, it's like, you do realize that you've made a career out of saying women shouldn't have careers. I can't get over it. It's the weirdest thing. Right, and all of that, you know, going to a completely topical topic at this moment, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene would never be in Congress in a zillion years. Exactly. Been for the efforts, for the efforts of people who disagree with her about every possible thing <laughs> you could find on the planet. Thank you for bringing up uh, QAnon, uh, Marge. Because, you mean uh, Q, Aaron, Karen? <laughs> yes. Uh, I I go. I saw QAnon Marge first, so I'm like sticking with it because it really love speaks it. to me <laughs> who she is. Uh, but like, I, so I know we, uh, and John, uh, I just want to sort of maybe close out that last segment with just saying thank you. Uh, I'm no lie, Jocelyn, this man is the hardest working man in politics. Uh, and I know a lot of people in politics. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and they should all take this very personally. They should. Come on. <laughs> they could do a tenth of what John does, but using the cultural power to tell a story that connects um, and helps people like sift through this propaganda canon. Uh, and it leads right into QAnon Marge because QAnon is that propaganda canon. Like the things, the wheels have come off of this billionaire train, right? Like they built this ugly, violent contraption and they thought they could always control it uh, and they can't. Uh, and, you know, if, if anyone hasn't read the Jakarta method, I, I highly recommend reading it. Um, this is like the epitome of chickens coming home to roost, right? Like uh, the, the tumult that's out there. Um, you know, if, you, if, if your thing is dependent on, on creating uh, a non-reality because you don't want to address climate change, right? So the greedy billionaires want to kill the earth so that they can have a golden yacht. And the only way they can do that is go on Fox News and say, don't believe your eyes, don't believe your ears, right? Don't believe the scientists. And, and they did it. And people don't, and you know, like, oh no, it just is the hottest year every year. That's not anything to do with climate. Be, when they divorced reality from reality, it leads directly to QAnon uh, Marge, who says, you know, the planes didn't hit uh, the Pentagon in 9-11 and, and all of the crazy, she literally believes that school shootings, literally, she said it, school shootings are planned by Nancy Pelosi and Hillary Clinton. And they're like, we need another school shooting. And then somehow the government creates these. And at the same time, it's not true. She chased down parents who lost their children to gun violence, to senseless gun violence in the schools, acts that are so horrible that any nation that, that just accepts them it deserves judgment. And our, our nation does for that. She got elected to Congress. So that ugly uh, machine, that machine of violence that the billionaires uh, built, I think the wheels have come off and we're seeing it just like crash and, and you know, you're seeing the split now, because you're seeing the plutocratic side, like uh, Mitt Romney be like, I say, we can't have this going on. You're like, you're horrible too, bro. Uh, but that is where we are. And so it's very terrible. But I got joy yesterday because QAnon Marge had all of her power stripped from her. And I, I think people outside of DC don't understand, like, what is it? What's the big deal of losing her committee? And you're like, that's where everything happens. She literally, she's, she shows up to work and has no job right now. Um, and because she's a Republican, the engine of Republicanism is corruption. 
So she, she, you can't do corruption. Corruption happens in the committees. Uh, and she just boop, threw her out. So I get great joy. And thank you, John, for reminding me uh, that, that too me happened too. yesterday. <laughs> I'm all for this fracture. It's a, it's a lovely fracture. Um, people should remember it doesn't have to be 50-50. The fracture can be 70-30 or 67-33 or 60-40. Um, all of that would be tremendously helpful because this is a fracture of the greedy and the ginned up bigots. That is the frac. That's what's fracturing. Mm -hmm. So in essence, it's the Frankenstein monster having been created by the greedy, you know, who who understood they didn't have enough votes to win anything. So we need these people. We really can't stand them. We were, they're horrible. We hate them, but we need them. So, you know, Mitch McConnell, consequently, you know, must be in league with Marjorie Taylor Greene or they can't win anything. And you, you see, you know, because it's not just Mitt Romney, it's Mitch McConnell too. It's absolutely Mitch right. McConnell. Right. So, so this is a real fracture where the the greedy personified by let's say a Mitch McConnell type are trying or Ron to, Johnson right Ron, Ron Johnson, Johnson is right, like pick, the pick a greedy Rick Scott you know the the biggest Medicare now second I, I'm really upset that Rick Scott got surpassed as the biggest Medicare fel fraud felon in history and now he's only second there was I didn't even know that what yeah, office for, for is Medicare the... fraud fellow who I think was the guy who Trump pardoned. You know, ah, the <laughs> there's the connection. The Rick Scott's only number two now in the history of Medicare fraud. But you know, these type of guys, which is, I, you can never have enough money, I meaning I can never have enough money. Um, and their effort to make sure that they keep the Marjorie Taylor Greens, you know, ginned up and ignorant, uh, so they created the Frankenstein monster. The monster is now devouring them, and it's welcome. Let's see how far it goes. Let's see what they do. But the ball is truly, I think, at this moment in their court. And you can see someone with a, with a very limited intellect, um, but very poor intentions. You can see someone like a Kevin McCarthy just grappling with what to do about this, like every minute of every day, which I take great pleasure in. Yeah. Uh, watching this guy trying to figure out, it's like, oh, what, 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 what do I say now? Well, I got to say the opposite of what I just said. Uh, but, you know, I'm and, not smart enough to really know how to say that. So what do I do? And I do think that it leaves, it leaves us in a position where the Democrats got to get together, do what they promised to do, and they, they should do it. They have enough people yes. to do it on their own. And just let the Republicans knife each other uh, for the next two years uh, while the Democrats are actually delivering um, pragmatic solidarity uh, with the American people or are in pragmatic solidarity uh, with them, which is my sort of uh, tossing it over to Jocelyn with uh, my favorite phrase that we got uh, uh, from Paul Farmer on pragmatic solidarity. Pragmatic solidarity, solidarity yeah. Uh, no, I mean, it's, it's, sorry, this has been such an educational show for me. It's, it's really interesting. And, you know, okay, so John, like, what would you, what would you tell people at home that are watching to do to get involved and to help? Well, the, there's, there continues to be, we, we will keep you apprised on policy issues mm -hmm. um, ceaselessly and endlessly. <laughs> so I do encourage everybody to make sure that they stay in contact with their own, especially Congress people. There's going to be a lot of there's going to be a, a lot of jockeying back and forth. Um, a lot of it's going to be very specific about you know this part of this bill or this part, of, and make sure that you know how to contact your elected officials. Um, you know. I always emphasize phone calls, especially for older people, because phone calls make staffs crazy and they have to report them so that they have way more, you know, because a lot of older people they bemoan staffs are crazy and they have to report that, that they're not that good on the internet, let's say, so they're not that good at knowing how to contact um, people online. 
don't worry about it that much. The phone is really good. <laughs> Get the phone number and, and hound your elected officials, um, especially if your elected officials are, if you're in a, a, a red or a purple district, you know, but, but do it if you're in a, in, in a blue district too. Um, and make sure that your voice is heard. Then beyond that, understand that 2022 is going to be a absolute water, watershed year. You know, it got to the point of absurdity where every one of the 110 events I was on, somebody said, this is the most important election of our lives. And I know we said that in 2018 and 2016 also. It's also gonna be true in 2022 because right now we have a moment of good solidarity. I would say, you know, I think Alex and I, you know, uh, agree at Social Security Works that so far so good on the Biden administration. The cabinet appointments are pretty much so far so good. Um, you know, we're gonna hold them accountable, but it does appear as if good lessons were learned from early on in the Obama administration, you know, including the thing that's going on right this minute which is, okay, we gotta go big and we gotta go, we gotta go big and bold and we can't let this get pared down. Um, so, but, but we've got two years potentially of that and then we have to make sure that we hang on to Congress enough to get anything done. So get yourself, get yourselves involved in these upcoming campaigns and make sure that we continue to hold the House, hold the Senate, and we will have the White House. But uh, th that, that's my advice to everybody is get involved, don't agonize, don't stop whining, never whine, never be scared, that's for Republicans. They're scared about everything and it's all about Such a pleasure having you on. I was going to ask you to sing us out. Is that possible? Oh, I, can do that. <laughs> I can do that with me. This is the final reprieve. Wonderful. Oh, it worked. <laughs> it worked. I think that's what did it for sure. Thank you for single-handedly <laughs> winning the election. Thank you. <laughs> all right, love you all. And uh, that's the that's the end of the show for us too. Uh, so we will see you next week. All good night.